Hey everybody, I was working on some other projects and I made a script that I think other people might find useful and I wanted to share that with you all and kind of explain how it works. So this script is to create modular panel pop-in animations. And what I mean by that is anytime you have a little panel that pops under your, your game window, you usually want a little animation, like a little effect, like a little you know fade. And I wanted it to be easy to adjust inside the inspector just by moving around variables. I didn't want to mess with animation clips and things. So this author code, it's very modular. I plan to reuse it and I wanted to share that with you all so you can use it in your own projects if you want. And I'll explain some of the code as we go, but largely it'll be me walking through code that already exists and kind of showing you how that works. Another thing I should mention is that I will link the script in case you just want to use it, which is fine too, but stick with me if you want to see the code and how it works in case you just want to tweak things and you know further customize it for yourself. Okay, so the first thing you're going to notice at the very top is that in order to use this script, you will need a rect transform and a canvas group on the object that you attach the script to. What that means is over here, you're going to want to put this on a UI object. So just make sure it's a UI object and it'll have a rect transform right there. A canvas group object, which is the other one over here, you can just add the component, or if you attach a script, it'll add it automatically. A canvas group just groups any child objects as one unit. This allows us to fade the alpha of everything uniformly from zero to one, and you can leave everything else the same over here. Just take note that if you mess with these things, it may block your raycasts or do other things. So uh, just be aware of that. The canvas groups are kind of interesting, but a little bit weird, but we will need one so that we can fade everything underneath as one unit. The other thing is I'm adding a setting here, just whether or not to play it when it enables. And then everything else underneath that is just related to the different things you want to do. And what I'm doing, like my general approach, is I'm getting my requirements inside of Awake. And on Enable, if we flagged Play on Enable, then we want to play. Our play method, which is public, so you can call it from anywhere. So if you don't want to call it on Enable, you can just have another script get access to this and tell it to play. I am keeping track of three different coroutines as variables. This just means that when I start a coroutine, I can reassign the same one. So if I want to restart it, I can, you know, I don't have multiple ones stacked on top of each other doing conflicting things. I'm only reusing the same pop in routine. So I'm saying if it's, if it's already playing, then stop it and reassign it. So uh, start a coroutine and assign it into this particular container for this coroutine. Further down here, for my actual pop-in routine, I'm doing a lot of scaling over time inside of our coroutine, and I'm doing this through code. Again, I didn't want to mess with animation clips. There's probably simpler ways to do this, but I like how exact and specific it is. So I'm creating two new variables right here that I'm going to reassign over time. And so this value will always be changing, which will change over here using lerping. Then we need to calculate our destination for both our X and our Y. So this is what we're scaling up to. We have our speed, which this is just a check to say if our speed is zero or less, then we're not going to do anything. Like don't try to do any calculation if our speed is zero. It means zero seconds, so nothing should happen. And then for my over time, I'm just using a for loop for this. And I'm using my T to track time. So I'm saying start at zero seconds and then track the elapsed time. If elapsed time is less than or equal to the speed, then keep going and increment time dot delta time on top of it. So just keep adding elapsed time until we hit the speed in seconds. Then we are reassigning this float that we created at the top and saying the new value is our starting scale our destination, and then whatever the fraction in between. So with lerping, we are getting a min and a max, and then we are getting some value that represents a point in between. And in this case, my min is my starting scale, my max is my ending scale, and my in between is my current time divided by the scale speed. So there's some math here. You don't need to worry about that. Just know that over time, we have our starting, we have our ending and we're going to calculate our value, everything in between. So we are reassigning our X, we are reassigning our Y, and then we are actually making the change, the panel's scale value. So we're, we are changing the scale over here, this on the rec transform, we are changing this scale value over time and assigning it right there. And then yield return null just means we're going to wait until the next loop so and then continue our calculation. 
So in other words, all of this is just scaling over time with our start, our end, and our speed. Now, this next part is interesting. This is our bounce back. And inside of animation, we would just call this bounce. And what this is, is when, when we're scaling up to a value, we may want to overshoot it and then return back to the value. So check this out. If I turn up my amount to, let's say, point, I don't know, 0 0.25, and I'll give it a speed, I'll say like 0 0.1. You see how it kind of pops out and overshoots it a little bit and then returns back? That kind of like swell and then return. That's what this is. That's our bounce overshoot. So if we turn this up by a whole lot and make it really slow, it's more obvious now, right? Uh, so our bounce overshoot, let's say 0 0.05. We'll keep this real subtle. 0.1, return speed. You see how it's kind of subtle? It just... It looks a little bit more organic. It doesn't stop immediately. It's kind of a nice effect. And so all I'm doing is I'm doing the exact opposite of what I did with the bounce setting. So I'm scaling it back down to my final destination rather than scaling up. So we're just scaling up, we're overshooting, then we're scaling back down to what we actually want it to be, which is one, one, one. So I'm just doing the same thing as above, just in reverse. Our start is our previous destination and our new destination is going to be 1-1 one, one because we want 1-1-1 one, one, one to be our final values just for consistency. So this is the same thing as above. We are just doing the inverse. So we're scaling down. So the same concept, I'm not going to explain it again, but we are lerping from our start point and our end point and getting every point in between over time. And then we are just changing the local scale of the panel according to our new calculation. So get our new X, get our new Y every single time we calculate it and then wait until the next frame so that we see this happen over time. And then at the very end, all I'm doing here is saying, no matter what, when we're done, I wanna make sure that we exactly hit our final one, one, one scale. So I just enforce it right there. So this is the pop in routine. There's a lot of math here. It's pretty long. The other ones aren't as long, but that's the idea. We are scaling upwards over time in code in a coroutine from our start to our end with a speed. Then we are scaling back down with our overshoot down to one, one, which is going to be our final scale. And that's the appearance that we have in game whenever we preview it, right? So this is our scale up and then our scale back down. The next thing we're doing is our fade. It's the exact same thing. We're going to animate the canvas group opacity. So with the canvas group, we have this alpha that will determine if I turn on my object over here, our alpha on our canvas group is the alpha of everything underneath it, not just the object that we're on, but all the child objects. So if I had text, it would also be fading with the same opacity. So it's useful to control a grouping of objects in one place instead of having to get the opacity of every single child object. That would just be way too much. So we're going to get the canvas group and we're going to animate it over time in the same way that we did with our bounce in and our overshoot. So in code that looks like this, if we have our variables up top, all I'm doing is I'm getting a starting opacity in case you want to immediately start at half opacity, then scale from half to one. Or if we want to start at zero and go zero to one, you know, we have the option to start at a value instead of always starting from zero. Just more control if you want it. So in our fade in over here, we have our fade in routine, which we're starting in the same exact way that we did with the other. So we're saying if it's already playing, then stop. But either way, we want to reassign our coroutine container and fill it with a new coroutine that we start. This is our fade in routine. So if I hop down here, we are getting a new opacity value. This is gonna be the one every single frame. We are checking if opacity change speed is zero or less, then it's it doesn't make any sense to do anything. So just skip. Otherwise, we're doing our same for loop. We're tracking T as our current time. Starts at zero, opacity change speed. This is in seconds. So keep tracking time until we go past the amount of time that was supposed to happen, increment time to delta time, then calculate a new value every single frame, every single time we go through our for loop, that's going to be equal to our lerp, which again is our starting, our end value, which is going to be full opacity, and then our fraction in between. So the same concept that we used on the other one we're going to use here. And then we're going to take our canvas group, get access to the alpha. That was our little thing over here and reassign it to this new one that we calculated. Remember the value in between our start and our end 
over time. And then at the very end, we'll uh, make sure that we set it to be fully visible. So it's just a shorter version of what we did above. I think this is the main explanation up here. When we do that. We make sure that we set it at the end and then we can test it. You can see, right? We pop it in, but we can have our fade. We can start at zero. You can see it's more noticeable or we can start it almost full and it maybe it's subtle. Maybe it's too subtle. I don't know. Uh, we can make it happen even faster if we want it to be more subtle, right? You can even barely notice in that case, make it slow. You know, some, some newer games like this feel that it's things are gradually coming into view and it's it has kind of a fluid motion to it, which is kind of nice. You know, if we wanted this to take longer, we would probably want to turn down the overshoot. Right. And maybe even the starting position and maybe even the scale. Right. If you just want our, your panel to pop in. You see how nice that looks like it's just it's very simple, but it adds something. So you could totally do that if you want. The whole point is that you have a lot of customization here. And the last thing we're going to look at is our movement. So this one's a little bit weirder because you have to think backwards. We have our final position, which is going to be wherever it's positioned but then we want to animate it in with an offset. So for example, if I type negative 50 in Y, we're going to animate in from negative 50 to where it is right now. So hit play. You see how it's kind of moving up from down below like that? That's starting negative 50 from current position as an offset and then going to where we originally have it positioned. But you could also do like X, for example, right? If you want to swing in from off screen or something, uh, maybe you do, maybe you make it more dramatic, right? Uh, negative 200. See how it kind of moves in from the left? You can adjust this too if you want, but that's what this is controlling. So to look at that in code, I'm not doing anything majorly different, right? Like I have my coroutine. I check to make sure it's, if it's not empty, stop the current one. So we can reuse the same one and not have multiple coroutines just doing weird stuff and then start a new one. I also didn't mention this, but I have an animation event here that I'm invoking in case anything else wants to know that this thing happened. Um, I also added this in between videos. I, I noticed that I didn't do a stop coroutine for my move in since that was a more recent addition. So I fixed that. And then down here for our move in routine, I think the only new piece of information is just trying to calculate the offsets. It can be a little bit weird math, but you need to figure out what is the starting point and you need to you know, keep in mind this is a local offset. So negative 50 is negative 50 from the current position. So you need to add your offset to your current position. It's kind of weird, but it should work. So don't worry too much about it. And then the other thing to know is that I'm animating using the, an the anchored position, meaning that your anchor over here will change what these position values are, right? Like if I put it in the bottom left, you see how my positions change. And when we reposition something, um, if we're not taking that into account, it's just going to be an absolute position. But we we do want to make it based off the anchor. And this should work based off the anchor, I believe. Let's test it out real quick. It should still calculate your offset. It's just using the values from the anchor, right? So if you don't do that, it's going to start in a random place on your screen, not where you anchored it and it'll be kind of weird. So I did come across that and I did have to account for that. Um, but we're doing the same thing, right? Like if our move speed in seconds is greater than zero, then actually animate, otherwise don't worry about it. And then we are just reassigning an X and a Y using our lerp, our start, our end, and our fraction in between to get a value. Uh, then we are reassigning the anchored position. We're giving it a new X and a new Y, which are the two ones that we're calculating right here. And then at the end, we're just making sure that if we finished, we set the exact precise values that we want. And I guess the last thing that I didn't really talk about before, it's always good to set your initial values when you start in case you want to return to anything once you do any kind of animation through code. Uh, I, I did call that inside of Awake, I believe. Yeah, Awake, uh, right after I got my components. So it's always good to save anything that you know you want to hang on to. So I did do that as well. Um, everything else you should be able to see just either by me scrolling here or just looking at the provided script. But this should work by default. Um, you've seen already that you can do a lot of different things. I really intended this to not be fancy, just to be like little sud subtle movements and 
reusable values you can adjust. And if you want something more complex than that, like if you want it to swirl or you want it to uh, do some weird dissolve fade, yeah, you'd probably want to make that a custom animation. But I wanted something that I could give some little subtle effect to that I could reuse just by putting a script on onto a thing. I didn't want to spend much time on it. I just wanted to reuse it, but have some kind of cool effect. So that's it. Hopefully you see the power in setting up a script this way, and I hope this helps you out. And thank you for watching.